is part of the creation myth of the Maori. And um, it literally translates into parent of the mist, parent wow. of the mist. And so it seemed quite fortuitous, you know, <laughs> to be given such a name like that, because I see that mist as the veil between the seen and the unseen worlds. Mm -hmm. And so to be one of, you know, the many people who are devoted to parenting mm -hmm. that liminal space and to mm -hmm. helping people cross back and forth across that uh, bridge, I guess yeah. you could say, um, it feels like it feels like I'm finally growing into my name. I left home at a very young age. I was 14 years old and I was exiled from my family. And I ended up living in the system, in the foster care system. <clears throat> and there were a number of dark years that followed after, which really was my initiation into being an orphan because at that age, I stopped having parents and essentially became independent um, of the system eventually. I was emancipated at the age of 16 and have been living independent of a family ever since. So, um, so you know, I say in the book that even though I, the book is about belonging, really what qualifies me to write about belonging mm -hmm. is the fact that I have been an outsider my whole yeah. life. Um, so it's not that I'm an expert in belonging, but it's in that it, it's more that my life has been characterized by this longing to belong. Mm. And um, I really felt that this was a, a personal quandary. But as I entered deeply into my own questions and into my own wound around feeling exiled and feeling outside of belonging, I began to meet so many other people who had the same experience. And I started to realize over time that this wasn't just an isolated problem, that actually we had a collective epidemic of alienation in the world. And so I became really curious to understand what are the origins of that feeling of estrangement and what are the ways in which we can treat belonging not as something that's outside of ourselves that we can spend a lifetime searching for in vain, really. And instead, I began to see belonging as a skill, mm -hmm. as a set of competencies that we in modern culture have lost, but that we can relearn and begin to practice. And in that way, belonging um, is reclaimed, not as something that someone else can bestow on us, but that we can practice. Mm -hmm. And so I, in the book, I really um, I sort of approach estrangement from three different levels. There's the personal level, and this is how we may be estranged from the entirety of who we are in our family homes um, at a very young age. Um, and then there is the level of culture, where there's this dominant culture that espouses and aggrandizes certain qualities as being the, you know, the great qualities such as mm -hmm. extroversion and um, success and strength and triumph and all of these things, victory, um, and, but it at the same time rejects a whole other set of very valuable qualities. Um, mm -hmm. such as uh, many of the things that I think the Hedge School stands for, like the invisible world, the feeling life, the, our ancestors, our relationship to nature, mm -hmm. um, dreaming, uh, intuition, magic, synchronicity. So what happens is when you have, a, and then of course the third level, I'll just finish that thought, is um, the level of the ancestral. And this is a very important one because we have so many people, if we trace our um, ancestral lines back, even just a few generations, um, we, most of us, have been separated from our people's indigenous land of origin, mm -hmm. uh, which creates a great rift um, mm -hmm. and sense of unbelonging and displacement for many people. So you have these three levels to contend with to, when talking about the origins of our estrangement. And so what happens in the context of shadow work is that the stuff that is 
exiled, the parts of ourselves that have been rejected, devalued, ignored, or not acknowledged, mm. they go into what the poet Robert Bly calls the long black bag that we drag behind us. <laughs> wow. That's his image of the shadow, right? And so this is becomes a kind of weight. It becomes a kind of power that drains us because it is not being welcomed into belonging. Shadow work is really the process of opening up this bag, uncovering that hidden stuff, and at the pace of our capacity, welcoming those exiled parts, those alienated parts of the self back to re-belong with us in our lives, in our culture, in our ancestral lines. And so um, for me, one of the greatest ways in which to do this work is actually dream work, because dreams are the first place where the alienated self will appear. And these dreams may look violent, they may look repulsive, they may look um, difficult, angry, sad, um, and, or neglected. Um, and we have to penetrate the urge to dismiss those kinds of dreams so that we can just become a little bit curious about what is trying to get our attention in the dream time. And when we do that, when we have just that small measure of curiosity and we turn towards the difficult dreams, often that's where this concealed medicine will reveal itself. So when you think about that long black bag, it's almost as if when something is, you can imagine if it were you, if you were exiled, you would probably become increasingly angry and vocal and rebellious because you have been rejected. So it is true with all of our exiled parts. And so you see their expression might appear thwarted mm -hmm. or difficult or angry at first. But if we can penetrate the urge to dismiss them or to run away from them, when we turn towards them, often we'll move through that difficult phase to discover that actually there is a creative potency, a creative power that wants to re-belong with us to be used for more creative and conscious purposes. There are patterns that um, nature has which are inclined to growth and light and wholeness. And if we can learn to understand the symbolic language of dreams, we can come into alignment with that nature, which is not just our personal purpose, but a purpose which fits into a larger ecosystem, which is the Earth's purpose. Um, so, so yes, emissaries is a beautiful way to think of dreams like messages from the divine. My greatest um, goal in life is to bring dreaming back to the people. And so everything about the way that I teach is really about um, reclaiming uh, our, our innate um, mother tongue, which is the language of symbols, the language of mm -hmm. images. And, um, and so I do try to offer those tools which people can walk away with. And of course, you know, these things take a lifetime to become artful, to become masterful with like any book learning, any great language. And there is always some mystery which remains undiscovered. So it was just this one very huge uh, giant, but also tiny um, experience with my ancestry and helped me understand the roots of my own ancestral um, wound around mm -hmm. exile, uh, which caused me to realize how many diasporas and indigenous cultures carry this wound um, mm -hmm. as a result of being stolen from their land of origin or made to flee uh, as refugees. Um, and I think it's really important for us to acknowledge this wound because um, it causes so much grief and even violence 
to live in without those reparations made around that wound. Um, so I really encourage people to do a lot of ancestral healing and exploration so that you can understand that the feeling of unbelonging that you carry does not start with your life alone, that actually it's many, many generations deep. You know, the holy wells were all about petitioning the other world, yes. petitioning the holy helpers in whatever form you see them, whether they mm -hmm. were um, fairies or nature spirits, whatever your particular yes. relationship is with the other world. But it's all about um, acknowledging the invisible and petitioning the invisible, the invisibles, I call them, for, um, for connection. Uh, mm -hmm. for acknowledgement and for me of course um, receiving that acknowledgement comes in two very significant ways that I let's say three three very significant ways one is through the dreams that we receive because often we would go to the we would go make the pilgrimage to the well and hope for a dream and that's how we would receive the acknowledgement that we've been heard by the invisibles um, and the other is um, nature itself, how nature communicates with us through many different languages other than the human language. And the third for me are the communications of the body, a very important to come into relationship and with our somatic awareness, whether that's discomfort, whether it's the, um, what I call the dark guests, which are the, um, the feelings that we like to push aside, like anxiety, fear, sorrow, mm -hmm. grief, Mm -hmm. um, so these are my, so this is my holy trinity of replenishing the wellness is turning back towards these three sources. And right now, when a lot of people are finding themselves in isolation during the pandemic, I think this is one of the greatest calls that we have during this time is to pull our allegiances back from the external world where we usually receive our permissions, our cues, our acknowledgements, and instead pull our, um, uh, strengthen our allegiance to the other world, to the inner life. Mm -hmm. And the relationship between well and wellness is very important because when our well is full, we feel well. And, mm -hmm. um, and this is so true when we feel now there's so much collective disorientation mm -hmm. as we do not know what is going to happen beyond the fog of this time. And we have so many questions. So many people have had to change their way of life and they're being forced into an, a kind of a chaotic period for some as they have to readjust. I think there is no more important time to be turning towards the well within mm -hmm. to petition and ask for guidance and to strengthen our relationship to the others to the holy within to the holy invisibles the holy helpers culturally we get a lot of stories which place an emphasis on the triumphant part of the heroic journey right they say oh and then they went into a dark night of the soul um, but then they were triumphant and they succeeded. And rarely is it talked about what that emergence is really like. But I think it's an incredibly valuable conversation because, in, in, you know, stepping into your higher self is easier said than done, right? There are so many gates that we have to pass through around our own sense of worthiness, around our bravery, around you know, going against the usual grain um, around the habitual pattern of shrinking back into smallness or silence. And all of this takes time. And in fact, emergence never happens all at once. We do have this 
notion that we should rid ourselves of longing, that it's something to be risen above or to got, be gotten rid of. But actually, in the Sufi way of understanding longing, longing is the elemental gravity that pulls towards us the life that is meant for us. So longing, even in, um, in the absence of the things that we wish we had in our lives, the absence itself needs to have presence. It needs to be welcomed and, and to belong in our way of going. So hopefully that helps you to reframe a little bit that when longing comes up, that it's so important to acknowledge and even venerate it because those absences, as, as, the, as your great poet John O'Donohue says, those absences enlarge our lives. Mm -hmm.